Aggie, wherever you are, she was sitting right there. Thank you so much for, for everything that you and your whole foundation is doing for patients and for science. You know, I, I remember the, the formation or watching the formation of the uh, foundation. I mean, clearly I was in nursery school and you were right there with me, but, but it's nice to know that, that precocious people can, can do good work. So thank you so much for everything that you do. So we're gonna cure pancreas cancer, uh, hopefully in the next half an hour. We'll, we'll work. We'll work on it, or at least we'll move a, a step forward in in that direction. And 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 to do that, I think you have to start with science. You have to know the limits of the science, and you have to know the the good parts of the science. Um, but we always have to remember that we're really not talking about groups of people or studies. We're talking about individual people. And what we're learning, as has been pointed out so many times this morning, is that each person with any disease, be it cancer, be it pancreas cancer, is an individual, and some of the nuances of what do you do uh, depend just as much on the individual as they do on the groups. So what I'll try to do, um, as well as, as, as showing you some of the science, is kind of give you the example of, of how oncologists, or at least this oncologist who has the microphone, uh, thinks, and, and some of the, the, the thoughts behind why we do what we do, perhaps leading you to questions that you can ask uh, if you have or know someone who has uh, pancreas cancer. Uh, so again, we want to talk about people, right? So here's a 59-year-old who's a little tired, a little bloated. You know, that's a really uh, rare kind of feeling that none of us have had before. Waits a couple of months, goes to the emergency room as pain gets very severe one night. Um, they thought that he had gallstones, um, and indeed he did. Um, but there was a shadow seen incidentally in the pancreas. And so I said here that he had a CAT scan, but typically he had an ultrasound, and he had an MRI, and then he had a PET scan, and then he had a CAT scan. And, and a bunch of things will, will show a mass at the head of the pancreas. A big workup shows there's nothing else there. We talked a little bit about tumor markers, if only they were so specific. Um, in his case, the tumor markers, the CA19-9 or the CEA that we often look at, were completely normal. And the question really is what to do. Well, to answer that question, what are my choices, right? Because that's going to limit a little bit about what the answer is. And we can look at radiation, we can look at surgery, we can look at chemotherapy um, for early stages of disease. And, and those are really broad terms for a lot of different things, even though that sounds like we have specific images when we think of the words chemotherapy, radiation therapy, surgery. Uh, if disease is metastatic, sometimes we have hormonal therapy, not really in pancreas cancer, uh, or at least the adenocarcinomas. We do use hormonal therapy in the other types of therapies. But we worry about resistance, we worry about toxicity, we worry about side side effects of everything that we do. So some of our answer to what do we do depends on what can we do and what are the implications of what we do for the disease, but also, of course, on the whole person. So, so this guy uh, went to Dr. Donahue, and Dr. Donahue had great cartoons to show him what to do in the operating room, um, thanks to Dr. Reber. Um, they had, uh, he, the patient had a complete resection of his tumor. It was uncomplicated, as Dr. Donahue told us it was, and the patient recovered very, very well. And so a pathology report is generated. One looks under the microscope. One tries to figure out what there is. There was an adenocarcinoma. It measured the size the lymph vessels, the blood vessels seem to have some tumor cells in them. We look at lymph nodes. A lot of us have thought about lymph nodes in breast cancer where people go digging in the axilla or the armpit. In pancreas cancer, as in many of the digestive system cancers, when one removes the tumor, lymph nodes come out with it. And we know historically that if lymph nodes are involved with cancer, there's a slight higher risk that the cancer could come back. Um, and again, tumor markers were normal. So we've seen this before, and, and really what I want to focus on in this short amount of time that I have to cure pancreas cancer is a very small group of people, people whose tumors are very, very small, perhaps confined to the local lymph nodes, but I can't help but talk about distant or metastatic disease because that's obviously um, part of pancreas cancer. As you can see, the vast majority of patients are diagnosed there. And we talked about staging systems, and it's kind of funny because on the internet it says, ask your doctor what stage you have. And as an oncologist, I have to say, 
I don't ever use staging systems, and I really don't know what the staging systems are because they change every five minutes. But now we, like most hospitals, have computer systems so I can pretend to sound smart with a computer screen here, the patient there, and just kind of looking around on the computer so I can sound like I know what I'm talking about when people ask the question. But, but staging systems were really developed to kind of say who's more likely to have a problem. Who's more likely to have the disease come back or who's more likely to have their normal life expectancy limited? And, and staging, if you kind of look at early stage disease as a small tumor, as the tumor gets bigger or it starts to invade locally, be it surrounding tissue or lymph nodes or what have you, is kind of a stage two or stage three tumor. And then a stage four tumor is where this cancer has spread to a metastatic site. There, I've spared you all the oncology fellowship. You can do what I do, um, and that's staging systems. But we look over on the right side. Good that I'm not a surgeon because I don't know my left from my right. The survival is not perfect. The survival, obviously, we worry about. And buried in those statistics, when we see those statistics and we hear and we worry and we, and we see day in and day out what those statistics belie, are a couple of things that are really important when we're bringing it back to an individual, right? Number one, they're historical. And a lot of times they come from groups of people that didn't have access to all of the things that we have today. Number two, it's a big collection of people, older, younger, sicker, not sicker, other medical illnesses, no medical illnesses. And when one is asking, the other question that's on the internet is ask your doctor for your prognosis because the doctor won't tell you. And we read the New York Times about all the doctors that are preventing patients from getting you know, accurate information because we may be afraid of giving bad news. Um, and I would say that, that the important thing to ask the question is, how do the statistics apply to me? Give me the ballpark because I want to know, you know, do I have a disease that I can just take some Kleenex and it'll be fine, like a common cold, or is this something that could potentially kill me? And the statistics aren't going to tell you how long you're going to live, but the statistics are going to ballpark it for you as to what the risks are of the disease affecting you. And that's going to depend on your age, your other medical conditions, and of course, the staging, and all kidding aside, I, I did read the book about what the staging system is and, and hopefully um, do know it just in time for them to change it again. All right, so what's adjuvant therapy? Adjuvant therapy for us is treatment that's given after primary therapy or primary curative or potentially curative therapy like surgery. So in other words, if, if we believe that, that cancers are curable and to an oncologist, and someone asked this before, but to an oncologist, cure means that the cancer goes away and stays away forever. Right? We don't use the word cure unless we believe that we can make the cancer go away. It goes away on Tuesday, comes back on Wednesday. I'm not so interested in the fact that it went away. So cure to us means that the cancer will go away and stay away forever. Remission's a word that people ask about. I don't know what that one means either. Again, for that Tuesday, Wednesday example I gave you. So if we believe we have a chance at curing the cancer, Surgery has to be involved. People don't usually die from tumors that were removed, right? Um, and if we believe that there's still a risk that there's cancer cells in the body that are at danger of coming back, can we, should we do something about that? And that's the principle of, or that's the, the idea of adjuvant therapy. So here are our issues. Back to what we started with. What are our choices? How likely are they to work? How convenient or how toxic is it? We'd all go to the moon if we need to. We'd all be miserable. I'll gladly make people sick if I can help them. But if I'm going to extend life by five minutes and making them people miserable along the way, I'm not really accomplishing very much. And so the is it worth it question is probably the most important question to be asking at any time, really for anything in medicine, but particularly around the issues of uh, cancer medicine. Who should we treat? How long should we treat for? If we can't see it and we can't measure it, how do we know that it's working? What drugs do we use? Do we use experimental drugs? Do we use conventional drugs? What kind of data do we need to convince us that the drugs we're using are the correct drugs? Um, should we use radiation and all the different types of radiation? By the way, someone asked a question about radioactive seeds, not beads. Yes, we do do them. Dr. Uh, Mudasami wasn't aware because it's the radiologists that usually do them. Um, and, and of course, UCLA, like most major medical centers, do them. Is cost an issue? 
right? How much should we be paying? Forget about the insurance versus no insurance. We can talk societally at a different conference, but we're talking today about individuals and sort of, you know, to what end is this therapy um, uh, appropriate? And then what about the use of personalized medicine or molecular analysis? So what are our choices? Here are conventional chemotherapy drugs for the most part. On the left are the conventional chemotherapy drugs, most of which have been developed in the past five to 10 years. So, you know, 10 years ago, as Aggie was pointing out, there was a drug that's very, very well named for cancer called 5-FU, right? There's an oral form that works. Um, and then all of these other drugs ha have been developed and specifically approved in pancreas cancer. On the bottom is a drug called erlotinib or Tarceva. In the family, some of you remember Martha Stewart getting trouble for insider trading. That's a different drug in this family. Supposedly targeted. And if we want to use the word targeted to say, attack the cancers that spare the normal cells, great image. I'm not sure that it's necessarily true because even the most targeted therapy can have side effects on the normal cells. And this was sort of famous because there was a study done in advanced disease that said that people who took Tarceva lived an average of 11 days longer. Now, we all kind of laugh at that until we remember that what are the statistics, right? If the average is 11 days, that means that half the people live longer. All right, so if it's 12 days, I'm still not so impressed. But buried in there might be some people who lived very, very long, just like those people move very, very short. When we talk about just bringing those huge groups of people together, Tarceva is not a, a wonder drug, but it may have a role in, in certain cases. Now, when we're talking about adjuvant therapy, right, people who've had surgery, disease is theoretically gone, maybe microscopically there, we often have to borrow from what works in the more advanced or metastatic or diseases that the cancer has spread, because that's the place where new therapies are tested first. That's not such a great idea, right? Because oftentimes those patients might be too sick or the characteristics of their disease may be very different than for someone who has disease at an earlier stage. And I think that soon, maybe now, maybe a little bit in the future, we'll start to see more and more new therapies being tried in cases like pancreas cancer that's been recently, recently resected because the risk of recurrence with certain characteristics can be very, very high. But we're a little bit stuck. And so you've probably heard of the combination therapies that are sexy right now in pancreas cancer that has spread. One's called Fulfirinox, developed in Europe. The Europeans like to come up with acronyms for their therapies, so it's really just a collection of, disease, of drugs on the left. And then NAB, Paclitaxel, or a drug is called Abraxane. Gemcitabine and Abraxane is, a, is an agent that, or a combination that's being used. So how do we gauge success, right? So there's different kinds of clinical trials, um, and we could talk about them at a different time or, or in the next break, but there are gonna be smaller trials where the statistics don't really give you the confidence that, that things working. In other words, you could take a group of 20 patients or 40 patients or 80 patients, and it may work fabulously well, but what if you happen to get a group of people that had one molecular characteristic or a group of people that had particularly bad disease or good disease? So we typically like to see phase three trials, which usually involve hundreds of patients, where a computer randomly assigns them to one thing or another. Now, it's kind of hard, back to the individual idea, if that's you, where the computer's deciding what you're supposed to get. So hopefully that trial will be giving everybody a traditional chemotherapy or a traditional treatment so that everybody gets some benefit and maybe half the group will get something in addition and the half may not. Again, still very, very difficult. Talk about crossover designs. We can talk about getting things done later. But, but typically we demand, or at least the FDA demands, large groups of people to, another, to understand whether therapy is working or not working, except and this is the big you know, uh, misnomer as well. If there is something that is working so fabulously well that any disease is melting away and people are feeling better, forget about whether their tumors are shrinking, but people are feeling better, living longer, that drug's gonna be approved. And there's probably, I don't know, five, 10 different examples in the past couple of years alone of drugs that have been so fantastic in the earliest of early clinical trials that they've been approved relatively quickly. And when they're not approved relatively quickly, it probably is because they don't work that well or we don't understand yet how to use them. 
Back to the individual, still really hard if you're the one or your family member or friend is the one that has the cancer, or you've got to deal with the decision now and we can't necessarily wait for the clinical trial to uh, be available. So clinical trials are of course looking at how long do people live, but oftentimes we can't wait or people might die of other diseases if they happen to you know, get into a car accident or something like that. So we're kind of cheating to say how long does it take before the cancer comes back or grows, or how long does it take before there symptoms come back, sometimes looking at blood test tumor markers as imprecise as they are. And sometimes you got to wait a long time. So if you have a disease and a therapy that's working really well and the FDA says we've got to look at overall survival, you got to wait sometimes five, seven, ten years, um, which is a good problem to have, except Cancer, I think, is ultimately about that individual conversation between a healthcare provider and a patient about what do you do now. You can't always wait, but you have to have your peripheral vision open to what's going on. I've heard that there are side effects to chemotherapy. Maybe some of you have heard that also. Um, we have the exorcist image, right, of the head spinning around, for those of us in nursery school in the 1970s, with the head spinning around and the terrible nausea and vomiting and hair loss and all of those kinds of things. Fortunately, a lot of uh, newer drugs do not make people as sick, though they can, um, and not to underemphasize the different uh, side effects of therapy as well. But we also have to worry about chronic side effects. So if you've cured somebody of their cancer with surgery, you've given them chemotherapy, you've cured their disease, and there's using the word cure again, but if you've given them long-term effects about their ability to think or work or be or do, or, or numbness and tingling peripheral neuropathy, you know, again, we've got to be able to deal with that as well. So how do we choose who gets therapy, right? We can look at traditional things, the size of the cancer, whether the margins are involved with the cancer, different molecular characteristics of the cancer, other medical conditions, age, and one thing that really doesn't get talked about a lot are the values of the individual person, right? What is it that is keeping you awake at night? Oh my goodness, the cancer could come back, or oh my goodness, I've got to go to the doctor, or oh my goodness, I might get sick, or I might not be able to play the guitar for a musician if I have terrible neuropathy. So these are all choices, and, and sometimes they're obvious, and sometimes they're not so obvious. It's a little bit about knowing yourself. So, so here's the science. The science tries to say, can we really understand, besides just the size of a tumor, what to do? And you can see these are sort of survival curves, where in the top, they, there was a bunch of different scales that were developed, and there's a group called low risk. And you can see that they do better than what would be called moderate or high risk. And then on the bottom is stage. And, and here's a cartoon that says, well, even if you look at stage, so look at stage uh, 1A on the bottom, you see that the very, very wide error bars say that some of those people have very, very high risk disease when you look at a different scale besides stage, and the risk of recurrence comes back, uh, is very, very high, and, and others may stage two, stage four, where they may do very, very well. A stage four patient who has a single liver lesion does really well with chemotherapy, you remove the liver lesion, you remove the pancreas lesion, a rare circumstance before we're jumping all to surgery, but you can cure a small group of people where before you wouldn't do that. Well, early studies looked at chemotherapy versus nothing. On the left side, you can see that people who had chemotherapy after surgery did better than those who were observed alone. On the right side, that was repeated again with a drug called gemcitabine. And here, in a world where gemcitabine and 5-FU were the only things that existed, you can see that the curves overlap, and it didn't really matter which drugs one used, which was sort of disappointing, a whole bunch of lore about gemcitabine. So let me just say that that it's always been our suspicion that combinations of drugs are better than single drugs, um, but it's never been proven yet. We all believe it, we all take that from metastatic disease, but it's never been proven yet. And we'll talk about that again in just a little bit. With radiation, um, the idea is that you can fix what you radiate, whether it be a traditional type of radiation called external beam radiation, intensity modulated or IMRT tries to use a CAT scan machine to aim the beams a little bit more carefully. There's stereotactic also called cyber knife or gamma knife, which is gonna try to give much, much more intense therapy to a small area. You certainly can fix the area, but you're not doing anything for the disease that may be beyond that area, and also, of course, there's the, the side effect. And proton beam will lead to another, com another uh, discussion because that's quite an interesting story. But there's both long and short-term toxicity. 
Well, in a world where we didn't have drugs, the traditional thought was give chemotherapy and radiation uh, before or after surgery. And now that we have better drugs, most of the studies seem to suggest that radiation does not add very much to chemotherapy, except in the individual cases where it does. Now, how do you figure it out? <laughs> I don't know, go to medical school again and teach me because I haven't been figuring out. But in all, in all truthfulness, when you've, when you've gotten to a place where you've done as much as you can do with chemotherapy and you still have a local problem with better radiation techniques, you can actually solidify that response, if you will. Or someone who has positive margins might be a better candidate because, again, you worry that there are some cells left behind. So, so radiation is, is often used and it's part of that multidisciplinary approach that we talk about. Well, what about other regimens? If something is effective in advanced diseases, should it be used in earlier stages? And should I, can I, will the insurance company pay for it? Is it a good idea? And what about room for creativity? Is creativity appropriate in the design of therapy? And typically, people here are looking at these two regimens, the Fulfirinox and the Gem Abraxane or Gem Nab Paclitaxel. And these are the studies that were done in people with advanced disease. And you can see that about 30 or 40 percent had significant responses. Now, to an oncologist, a response demands that the cancer shrink by 50%. So if it shrinks 49%, that's well, a pretty good thing. That doesn't count as a response. That's called stable disease. So, so it's just a way of comparing you know, uh, across multiple studies. And what people have sort of said here is that both of these regimens work. They've never been compared to head to head, which is what we really want to know when you compare them head to head. You're not supposed to compare across studies, but, but people do. And people have said, well, if fulfirinox has the highest response rate, maybe that's the drug that you should be using in those cases where you're trying to shrink cancer to see if it will become resectable. Fulfirinox happens to be much, much more toxic than gem abraxane. Um, and again, if someone's never going to surgery, do you think that more toxicity makes them feel better? Definitely not. Do you think that more toxicity makes them live longer? We don't know. So the optimist would say that shrinking a tumor makes somebody live longer. The pessimist said what I was asking about before, shrinks on Tuesday, grows on Wednesday, I'm not sure that we've helped. So this is kind of where people are, are thinking right now with traditional chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting, is combinations of drugs must work better than just gemcitabine or 5-FU alone, even though that's not necessarily been uh, approved. Personalized medicine, really sexy right now. Um, really important because we buy into this idea that we should be able to understand beyond just an individual, uh, uh, beyond a common diagnosis, differences in between the person that does really, really well and the person that doesn't do so well. We ought to be able to predict that. And the idea is that you take a big group, the statistics look horrible. If you start to look at individual characteristics, you can figure out drugs that work better or not, drugs that might be more toxic in this group or that group, and trying to understand that uh, specifically. And there have been many, many areas of success in lung cancers. There's a group of lung cancer patients, one or two percent of lung cancer patients that have a specific mutation. There's a drug that blocks the mutation. A pill a day can make metastatic cancer to the brain disappear uh, for many, many years. And we think that that chipping away at the diagnosis to subdivide pancreas cancers or subdivide any disease is really the future of medicine. So I took this from a website because it's grouping, it's working with uh, PANCAN, one of the pancreas cancer advocacy groups, I think it's called Perthera, with this idea that we take a biopsy, we run it against a whole bunch of genes called a profile. It's analyzed by the company. They have a special super duper expert medical review panel. I didn't happen to look to see who was on it that's supposed to interpret for you what to do. And out comes a report that tells you and your doctor exactly what drugs you should use. The optimist says, this is wonderful. This is really understanding with the latest in science what's going on with your tumor. The conservative says it's a little bit like astrology, right? Where if it works, we told you, and if it doesn't work, well, we didn't tell you it was going to work. We said it might work or it's likely to work. So I think that, that societally, this is the future of oncology. We have to understand these data. We have to be able to learn more about cancer where the science might be a little bit ahead of the clinic, but to an individual, we have to use this information in today's world with the appropriate characteristics. 
So this is a little bit like audience participation, and I'm being facetious, of course, because if someone can tell me what to do with this information, I will gladly listen. So this is from Foundation Medicine, another company that's, that's used, and, and I have stock in neither, um, so don't mind either. There's about 20 of them, where they'll give you these reports, and on the left, you can see something called a PI3 kinase mutation. It's a growth factor pathway, and there are drugs that exist that are approved for other cancers where the report will say, this person has a PI3 kinase mutation in her tumor. You might want to consider using this drug. Right? Well, this drug isn't approved by insurance. It's about $15,000 a, a month. And people you know, might choose to rob a bank, or those with yachts and museums might choose to sell one of the, the benches on the yacht. Um, but when the drug doesn't work, they kind of look at us and say, well, well what happened? Right? And there was a study done in pancreas cancer with these drugs that show that the drugs don't work. Just like. There was a patient on one of the studies who had tremendous benefit. So, so clearly there's an answer in here somewhere that we really just haven't understood quite yet. There are mutations that we know about. KRAS is one that's very common in pancreas cancer. It tells you that Tarceva doesn't work very well, and there's a lot of research focused on people with KRAS mutant tumors. There's some on the bottom here that you know I, I have heard of because I read this report, um, or, or I do uh, a lot of experimental therapy work. So, I think that this is great information, but I'm not quite sure what to do with it. And, and we use it because if we're choosing amongst equals, then it might tip us one way or the other. But to take an, a, a drug that's never had any benefit in pancreas cancer, I worry a little bit about putting people at risk. In a research protocol, yes, but if not, I worry a little bit. Let me just finish real quickly by talking about neoadjuvant therapy. Um, let me it's, uh, to talk about the, the idea that the cancer might be resectable one day if we can remove it from some of the blood vessels um, or ducts. Uh, and, and Tim was talking about that. Again, how likely is the treatment to succeed? What are the toxicities? What are the long-term effects? What drugs do we use? And, and you can see that when patients are appropriately selected, and you can see it in, in Tim Donahue's data or the UCLA data, that when patients are selected appropriately, right, where you've really given some careful thought as to who's going to benefit and who are you just cutting for the sake of cutting as much as we all want cancers removed, you can actually improve people's uh, survival. And here's a number of studies that have shown that in the appropriate selected patient, of course, the magic words, uh, resection after chemotherapy, after radiation therapy is, is so helpful. And of course, the idea is that if, if you're really going to be giving surgery, then chemo, why not flip it? And if you, several months have gone by to satisfy one that the disease is really confined and responding and not spreading, then that's exactly the candidate you want to take to surgery in the right center. What's new in adjuvant therapy? Well, people are actually trying to do studies with those regimens that we've spoken about, gemcitabine and abraxane. Fulfoxiri is just the Italian version of fulfirinox. Whether stereotactic radiation, maybe that gamma knife, cyber knife really matters or not. And then Fulfox A is really the same regimen where you take out the arenatecan, which can be so toxic, and add abraxane. And there's many, many other experimental agents being tested alone and in combination, and we can speak at the break. Immunotherapy is very, very sexy right now because childhood vaccines outside of Santa Monica are very well thought of. Um, <laughs> I've been vaccinated, my children have been vaccinated. Um, but, but the idea that you're using the immune system to treat the cancer, and this right now is being used in advanced stages of the disease, but really it might be better used in earlier stages of disease when there's less disease to worry about. So this is the uh, Aduro vaccine where about a year ago a study was announced that we're curing pancreas cancer by double vaccines, and the FDA said that's great, how do you know that you need both vaccines rather than a single vaccine? So there is a clinical trial being done worldwide Unfortunately, it's randomized against chemotherapy, where you might be selected to receive chemotherapy alone. If the vaccines are so great, they'll be approved very quickly, and one will be able to get them. And if not, good that you were on the chemotherapy arm, I suppose. So what do you do? I guess the first thing to do is really find the right care team. And that care team has to be multidisciplinary, because in today's world, as we hope to have convinced you today, uh, it, it is a complicated disease that requires lots of people working together and talking together with high case volume and that has research to learn about every patient so they can help you best. But I would also say find the right care team for you, right? And that's about communication styles, making sure 
sure that your questions are being answered and that you're not worried that unless you check the right internet site, you're gonna die. And it's really about making sure that the doctor understands to do that with you and for you. Following curative surgery, you know, I'll be very scientific and say, I'd do something and I'd probably usually do something, so that's very definitive. If surgery is not possible at the beginning, discuss how likely surgery is going to be. And as difficult as a conversation as that is, it's important to get that information. But always, always, always keep an eye on the future in terms of all of these issues of molecular analysis, uh, profiling, genetic counseling, screening, prevention, and disease surveillance. I probably went a little over. You're kind to indulge me. Thank you for coming on a Saturday night. After pancreatic surgery, the CA199 is normal, the CAT scan and the PET scans are all normal, so there's no sign of cancer, but experience says there are microscopic residual cancer cells left over. So they continue chemotherapy for some period of time. Is there a test or some way to monitor whether those residual cancer cells are going down or left zero? So, uh, I don't know. Um, but the first part of your question is, I think, the key. When we say that the CAT scans are normal or the tumor markers are normal, I don't know how much we can always believe that. And I think Raman showed you that case where everything was normal until he found the, the tiny spot. So we know historically, and this is true across all cancers, that if we stop at surgery, a high percentage of people will have their disease come back. So you're, we may be over-treating some people and we may be under-treating others. People have looked at things called circulating tumor cells, trying to take a blood test to see if there's a number that you can assign to if you have tumor in the blood or how much is it. Didn't really work, everyone pulled those machines again. There's a bunch of different assays. We talked about tumor profiling. There's a bunch of new programs coming out where they're looking at blood rather than tumor tissue in order to quantify, and again, whether that associates with how well the chemo is working or not, how long you live or not, whether you should continue or not, uh, it's welcome to my nightmare. Your yes, patient sir. comes to you. He says, or she says, um, the chemo cocktails are not working. However, I heard and read about this incredible clinical trial. Put me on it. Can you do that? And can you make sure that you're not one of the placebo people? How does that work? Um, you probably visit my clinic very often because that happens about 15 times a day. <laughs> um, not only put me on the clinical trial, put me on the right arm and make sure that it works because even though it's experimental, I know it's going to work. Um, the idea is, is really if it were only so simple, right? If something was truly proven, it wouldn't be investigational. I understand the idea that the United States is trying to suppress cancer therapies to support drug companies. But there are 170 other countries in the world where somebody might be able to get through. So, you know, I kind of go away from all of that. I think it's about saying, here I am in today's world, what's the best available for me, not what's the sexiest and what's the nicest website and what did I hear in the parking lot, but what's really the best for me. And sometimes that's traditional therapy, sometimes that's alternative medicines, and sometimes that's experimental medicines. Um, most trials that we do at UCLA, minus the vaccine trial, which is not my favorite trial, do not have randomization, do not have placebos. So when you're on the trial, you're on the trial. And those are questions to ask about which trials are appropriate and effective. But just because it's new doesn't mean it's better, right? I never thought I'd be old enough to say that, but um, sometimes it is. And it's just about what's right for you or what's right for the person and their individual story. Uh, Dr. Rosen, first, excellent presentation. Um, what you just said, it caught my attention um, when you said that you're not a particular fan of uh, vaccine trials. I was on the... Uh, uh, impress uh, trial uh, that went a year, and uh, that's after resection surgery, and my cancer didn't come back. When it ended, unfortunately, my cancer came back in the liver. Um, they're very close uh, on uh, perhaps going to the FDA for approval on that. So why don't you think uh, uh, emiological is, is a real breakthrough? I probably misspoke or you might have misunderstood me. I was saying I was not a fan of this particular trial because it's randomized. I understand that it needs to be done. It's sort of the FDA demands that it be done. If ever it's going to benefit somebody, it has to be done. But but not being I don't like 
trials that are randomly assigning my patients. So I'm a big fan of immunotherapy. I think immunotherapy, we talk about PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, which have not really worked yet in pancreas cancer, have done tremendous things in skin melanomas and primary lung cancers, and I think really will be the future of medicine. So I, I really very much believe in vaccines and immunotherapy trials. I'm not sure that they're ready for prime time, even if they're sexy. One other uh, quick one. Um, obviously, uh, early detection is, is critical with pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think we'll get in the next five years to where we have something like a blood test that's definitive or some other definitive early indication of pancreatic cancer? I hope so. I don't know that pancreas cancer will be the lead in that, but you know, just like the AIDS crisis gave oncology a lot of information, both in detection and development of drugs, I feel like other cancers might get there first and help us figure out how to adapt it into pancreas cancer. Even if we haven't been treated at UCLA before, do you still accept people? making an appointment or coming to see you regarding clinical trials? I'm sorry, we're closed, we cured cancer, we're done. <laughs> Everyone is more than welcome. Whether they choose to just visit, whether they choose to transfer their care, we work with lots and lots of other cancer centers and oncologists all the time, and hopefully we will not ask someone to, to drive and get treatment if they can get it closer to home, but we'll always work with their local physicians. And it is true that all clinical trials, all information is shared with Everybody else in the same field, correct? Yeah, yeah. Google.com. Google.com. Yeah, it's actually a law now, um, but but Google.com. So so if you're not uh, sufficient, find one of my teenagers, and they will tell you exactly where to go. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Lee, thanks very much.